everyone, Mike here. Welcome back to my series on sound. In this episode, we're going to review some basic concepts and look at the first tools we will use to accomplish our goal of decoding surround sound from stereo. I've put timestamps in the description so you can jump ahead to sections that interest you or you can watch all the way through, which I would definitely prefer. Let's get started. When solving any kind of problem, it always helps to state what our goals are, where we're starting from, and how we'll know we've succeeded. Our final goal is to be able to generate surround sound from stereo. We'll come up with criteria for how to evaluate that in a future video. And right now, many of you are starting in different places with different levels of knowledge about sound and code. So for this episode, I'll provide brief refreshers for basic concepts with references to learn more. Then at the end, we'll look at one of our tools for learning and exploring sound. Let's start with the concept of sound itself. Where does it come from? How does sound reach our brain? How do our brains know where a sound is coming from? You've all probably heard that sound is vibrations reaching our ears, right? For our purposes, sounds generally have a source, a transmission medium, and eventually they reach our ears. There might be extra steps in there as well, like a microphone turning a sound into an electrical signal that is later reproduced by a speaker. At the source of a sound, something moves one way, which pressurizes the air around it, then moves the other way, which briefly decreases the air pressure. So the pressure goes up and down because the moving source presses the air molecules closer together, or creates a space to allow the molecules to move apart. Let's do this faster and faster. We call this vibration. Each full movement up and down and back to where we started is called a cycle. When something vibrates repeatedly, anywhere between roughly 20 and 20,000 cycles per second, or hertz, this produces a sound that we can hear. Anything slower or faster we can't hear. We call things slower than 20 hertz infrasound, and anything faster than 20 kilohertz, kilo means thousand, we call ultrasound. The number of times sound pressure goes up and down per second, the number of cycles per second, is called frequency. Okay, now we've got the air pressure changing up and down. How does that reach our ears or microphones? Well, when you bunch up or space out the air molecules in a tiny area next to a vibrating speaker, those bunched up air molecules run into other air molecules, which bump into more, and so on. This doesn't happen instantaneously because there are gaps between the air molecules, and they move mostly randomly. Let's graph the velocity of these molecules compared to distance from the speaker. Areas where the molecules are moving the fastest also correspond to extremes in pressure. This is a very rudimentary particle simulation with simplified physics, so the graph isn't perfect, but hopefully you can see the idea. The speed at which the change in pressure can move is called the speed of sound. The speed of sound changes with temperature, elevation, and humidity, but a lot of the time we can just use the speed at room temperature at sea level, which people have measured to be 343 meters per second. Let's look at the other side. These pressure changes vibrate our eardrums, and we hear that as sound. We can tell where a sound is coming from by how loud it is in each ear, by the delay between ears, and by frequency changes caused by the shape of our ears and heads. We'll revisit these factors in future videos because they will be important to our surround sound decoder. Anytime we have something going back and forth in one dimension, when measured along another dimension, we call that a wave. The dependent variable, the y-axis in our graph, can be pressure, voltage, distance, temperature, anything. And the independent variable, the x-axis, can also be anything, including time, distance, and so on. If we see this back and forth motion across some dimension, no matter what we're measuring, that's a wave. When we're measuring a wave with time as our x-axis, the length of one cycle is called the period. The period is measured in seconds per cycle, and is just the reciprocal of cycles per second. With distance as our x-axis, the length of one cycle is called the wavelength, and we can calculate the wavelength if we know both the frequency and the speed of sound. 
We can also calculate the frequency if we know the speed and the wavelength. Longer wavelengths correspond to lower frequencies, and shorter wavelengths correspond to higher frequencies. So that's how we measure the width of a wave. What about the height? With sound, taller waves are louder, shorter waves are quieter. This is called amplitude. Its unit is whatever the y-axis is. Voltage, pressure, and so on. We measure it from the x-axis to the top of the wave, because this is the value that you multiply a wave by to get this height. We're starting to get a handle on waves now. We've seen that waves come in different sizes. What about shapes? The most fundamental shape for a wave is, as many of you have seen before, a sine wave. This is the smoothest possible wave, and it's smooth because it's based on rotation around a circle. If something is moving in a circle, and you graph its displacement in just one dimension against time, you get a sine wave. Its displacement in the other direction is another sine wave, just shifted in time. One other thing to notice is that when the rotating point is moving the fastest up or down, it's come to a complete stop in the left or right direction, and when it's moving the fastest left or right, it's stopped going up or down. Okay, so far we know that sound travels in waves, that waves have a definite speed, and that waves are related to circles. One of the concepts that this relationship with circles helps us with is called phase. Phase is simply a measure of how far a wave has gone through one full circle or cycle. Delaying a sine wave by some fraction of a wavelength is the same thing as rotating along a circle by the same fraction, so phase is measured as an angle. Now, most of the time in math you'll work with radians, but sometimes, for sound purposes, we're going to use degrees with the usual 360 degrees in one full circle. The number 360 is useful because it's easily divisible into fractions. For example, one-fourth of a circle or a wavelength is an even 90 degrees. And just as a refresher, we measure angles counterclockwise, starting from the positive x-axis. Phase is measured relative to some reference, which could be another wave of the same frequency. When these two waves are perfectly aligned with each other, we say they are in phase or at zero degrees phase. When they move in exactly the opposite direction, they are 180 degrees out of phase, halfway around the full cycle. We sometimes call that exactly out of phase, or inverse phase, because when you add two sine waves that are 180 degrees out of phase, they cancel out entirely. Of course, we can have any relative phase in between, too, from 0 degrees to 360, or, if you prefer, minus 180 to 180. The top graph shows two separate waves whose phase we are changing, and the bottom graph shows their average. Subject to some caveats, simple waves like sine waves can be made exactly out of phase by delaying by half of a wavelength. Notice how the bottom wave fades to zero as the two top waves approach the same amplitude but 180 degrees out of phase. Also note that amplitude and phase are independent characteristics of a wave. And all waves can be made exactly out of phase by multiplying by minus one. This aspect of phase is going to be an important part of our surround sound decoder. So these are some of the fundamental concepts we will use when studying sound and building our surround sound decoder. It might not always be clear up front how a concept or idea or tool will be useful. Eventually, you'll find a connection to something else. All of these concepts and details can be overwhelming. But over time, as more connections are made, we also find common patterns that let us group concepts together. We can look at all of these ideas over here and put them into a box with a label, like waves or whatever. This is called abstraction. By building up layers of ideas, we can free ourselves from having to think about the details when we're solving a problem in the big picture, and vice versa. Now let's take a step back and look at the whole picture. At a fundamental level, this series isn't just about sound, it's about problem solving. We can refer to this somewhat fuzzy collection of concepts, problems, and solutions as a problem space. We're trying to map this territory and find a way to reach our final destination. There might be dead ends, but each dead end will give us a hook for solving other problems later. That's how you build out your mental map of the problem space.
you'll be able to solve more problems and more new things will start to make sense. No matter what type of complex problem we are solving, we are doing the same kinds of things to chart a course through problem space. So the techniques we use to explore sound and solve the problem of making a surround sound decoder can be applied anywhere. Whenever we have a goal but we don't know much about solving it, one really important tool is creating a fun place to play, experiment, and learn. For me, a big part of that is code. I built my own interactive sound environment while I was learning all of this, and now I'm making it available to all of you. If you like, you can download the code and follow along. Also, definitely check out the references section at the bottom of the README. Okay, so this is the interactive sound environment that I've been working on and that I'm sharing with you. So I'll give you a little demonstration. You can list sound files that have been included. We can generate tones. We can change the waveform. We can also change the volume. You can play different tones in each speaker. can also plot tones. And there's a graphical mode. What else? Uh, you can read sound files in and modify the sound. So you can read the sound file. And that gives us an array with the left and right channels. Those are pneumo D floats, one for each channel. That is a, a numerical computing gem for Ruby. We can reverse the sound. And that's kind of interesting. So let's save that to a file. So there's the write method. We tell it what file we want to save to, the data that we want to save, and the sample rate of the data. And then we can play that sound file back. I think that's pretty useful. And for more experienced Ruby programmers, you can use the standard pry interface and take a look at the source code. So I'm going to be adding a lot more features to this in the future. I've already written a lot of these features internally, I just haven't cleaned them up for release yet. So look forward to those with future episodes. I'll also just demo real quick how I've integrated this Ruby code with my custom data visualization software, and that's how I generate the visualizations for these videos. So that's the first version of the interactive sound environment. I hope you find it useful for exploring sound, and this will serve as the foundation of our surround sound decoder project. Thanks for watching. Be sure to comment and let me know if you have any questions or if there are things you'd like to see in future episodes. Also, thanks to anyone who watched drafts of this video. I've created a playlist with some of the other sound videos from YouTube. You can go check those out. There's a lot of great ones out there. I've also put a link to that playlist in the description. So that's it for now. Thanks for watching and until next time.